do like 2,500 jobs a year. We're just shy of 1.5 million a year, but we didn't start there, of course. If you're in the like the earlier stages of business, if you can reserve your time almost exclusively as best you can for going out and like that's the greatest gift and contribution that you can make to your company. What is going on, guys? Today, I'm joined by Brandon Lazar. He is a serial entrepreneur with lots of experience in the pressure washing space. So Brandon, super excited to be speaking with you today. Awesome, Michael. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm, I'm super excited to get into it. Yeah, 100%. So for starters, do you mind just sharing your background and kind of what got you into this industry? Yeah, for sure. So for 15 years, I had a gutter cleaning, window cleaning and pressure wash business. Eventually, it got to the point where we we're in three different locations. We had 15 work vans. And uh, we do like 2,500 jobs a year, which is just crazy. It's mind blowing to look back on. But we didn't start there, of course, right? We, we started from very humble beginnings. And really, I was in my first year of college, uh, borrowed a friend's mom's minivan and uh, a ladder, and we were technically in business. So we were kind of doing like the side hustle before side hustle was maybe even a term. Mm -hmm. And back then it was cool because like, if we made enough to cover tuition for next year's schooling, like five grand, like we we're totally in the clear. And uh, I feel like that's good advice for any entrepreneur, like start as early as you possibly can. Because when when you start early, and you're young, it you kind of create that situation where you can really do no harm. So yeah, that's kind of my, my origin story with with respect to the home service business. That's awesome. So are you still part of that business to this day? Or did you exit that company? Yeah, so one year and a month ago, we actually exited from that company and uh, we're, it's officially behind us. So now I focus, I'm a Conquer coach. I also have two other real passion projects going. Uh, Ninja VA does virtual assistant placements for the home service industry and the trades industry. And that was one of the real breakthroughs that we experienced while I had my home service business. And then I also have a, another software application, it's called Bonus Up, and it does performance pay bonus systems for uh, field technicians of home service businesses. So we're kind of scratching our own itch. We came up some, with some really great solutions and ultimately we're, we're packaging them up and making them available for other people who are in those same shoes to to enjoy the benefits of them. That's awesome. So I definitely want to dive into that in a bit, but before we do so, do you mind um, to the extent you can like kind of just sharing the numbers behind the business, like either the revenue you guys got to or anything in regards to that? Yeah, definitely. No, it's I'm an open book and Basically, we, we were just shy of 1.5 million a year. I am located in Canada, so we're not only seasonal here, we're, we're hyper seasonal, right? So like we go literally from two technicians in February to 32 technicians in May, every single year. And we'd be lucky if we had like six repeat staff members. So we had to heavily systematize our business in, in kind of all aspects to account for that like crazy growth trajectory. Yeah. So yeah, three locations, 15 work vans, 2,500 jobs totaling just shy of 1.5 million. Wow. Okay. Well, cool. So the first thing I want to dive into, which I'm aware is kind of like your area of expertise, and I'm sure that played a big role in being able to scale and kind of manage that growth back when you were a part of the business was virtual assistants. For starters, do you mind kind of just sharing the benefit of having a virtual assistant within the company? Yeah, I'd love to. And if, if it's okay with you, I'd just kind of like to rewind back to like what my story was that got me on that path to begin with, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I did the kind of like brick and mortar type approach with the customer service rep, the CSRs coming into the office and obviously doing 2,500 jobs, each with their own like customer life cycle where customer calls in, they get a quote, they get booked in the schedule. Like there's a lot of steps there times 2,500 is a lot of admin work, right? So we were doing the brick and mortar thing. We at our peak had four full-time CSRs coming into this very office that I'm in now. And um, when you ramp up so quickly and we have so much going on, it, it was really proving to be such a clunky process in the end. Like it was really frustrating. And ultimately, if your admin's off, you know, as you know, if your admin is off or not on their game, like the rest of the operation just really suffers, right? And we were really struggling. We we're coming out of our busy season where we would get up to 285,000. We did half our year's business in the months of May and June, those two months. So we we're coming out of a 285 month and it was just, it, it felt like we we're just barely hobbling through the finish line. And ultimately we had a mishmashing of CSRs, each with kind of their own deficiencies, call it. 
And ultimately, it just left me in a position feeling like we're overpaying here for like a significant under delivery in terms of skill, uh, attention to detail, even down to like attendance was a problem. And that's when I made the super difficult and, and frustrating choice to essentially ax all four of our CSRs at the time, which, which really sucked. And I blame myself first, you know, to, to start. Um, but we terminated all four CSRs and then we started it in on our journey with, with virtual assistants running the show. Gotcha. Okay. So your yeah. decision was primarily focused on the fact that you could get the same quality or even maybe even better quality, the same quality of work while getting it for significantly less cost. Yes. And I would say the other benefit is like the level of engagement and the level of commitment in general, like we're talking very generalized terms here, right? Which you got to be careful with. Um, but for the most part, you know, we, we got a lot more commitment out of the equation and it just felt like there was a level of respect for what we were bringing to the table where like, you know, my threshold for excitement locally and in person was like, did the person show up were, were they hung over and smelling of booze, you know, were they having a good day or a bad day? Like it was very binary where with the VAs, it was like a breath of fresh air. I feel, feel like it's going back like 20 years in time where like, you know, you cared about an opportunity. Opportunities were not like just expendable and you, you truly wanted to do right and, and well by your employer. So that's that's kind of the generalized form of it for sure. Gotcha. Okay. And, you know, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Obviously, this is a very general statement, but tends to be true where people in the United States might feel a little bit more entitled almost, whereas people overseas they're much more grateful. Like you can pay them significantly less than what you would pay here, but that's still higher than the average salary from wherever they're based. And they're super grateful and very loyal to you and they'll go out of their way to do amazing work. So I, I definitely agree with you in that. Yeah, totally. And and the crazy part too is like, if we're paying our virtual assistant like eight to $10 an hour, we're paying them the equivalent of what a dentist makes in the Philippines, right? Like a teacher makes like two to $3 per hour. So when we're, offering these jobs, even at, you know, by our standards, which are, are very nominal price points, they are like very coveted and they're like great paying jobs over there. So you, you can feel good that like we're, we're ticking the box in terms of like our social responsibility, but also like these are great paying jobs that are obviously the more you pay, the, the more commitment and buy-in that you're going to get on the other end, of course. Yeah, 100%. That makes a lot of sense why you decide to go the route of hiring virtual assistants. Now, when it comes to the tasks that you actually delegated to them, I know a lot of people will talk about, you know, virtual assistants, they can only handle a certain type of tasks. Did you see that to be true? Like, were there certain tasks you had them do or? Yeah. So I would say when virtual assistants work, they work really well. It works really good, right? The problem is, is there's a ton of ways to do it wrong. And I think it starts with the hiring funnel, right? Because again, like I said, we would go from two technicians to 32 technicians. So we got really good at building out very picky hiring funnels that in the end would spit out very top notch, very qualified, very able individuals for that role, right? And really what we did is we took our knowledge and understanding of that hiring funnel and reattributed it to the space of virtual assistants. So, you know, I was on a call today where the person had tried two different virtual assistants through a different agency and ultimately like the the ability to speak English just was not intact. And then really that, that kind of casts a, a negative shadow, I would say on the industry. And then people are like, ah, virtual assistants don't work or I can't allow my phone to be answered by a VA. And like, from my experience, if you do the hiring properly, you absolutely can. We got to make it a priority and we got to get really, really picky. Ultimately it comes down to like a quantity exercise, right? In at Ninja VA, we have 200 initial applicants for one single candidate. So when you're that picky, you do get to the point where you're happy to have that person answer the phone and they represent your company really, really well. Yeah, that's definitely an issue I've noticed personally when hiring virtual assistants in the past is, you know, not necessarily language barrier, but the accent, which for when you think of the customer, they want to work with the local company. They want to know they're supporting a small local and business, even if you're not necessarily a small business. 
Um, so when they hear the accent like that, for some people, it does generally turn them away. So that has seemed to be an issue when hiring virtual assistants. And so what you're saying is it's just a volumes game, like as long as you get in enough volume. and you... I, I think it's a volume game and you have to be very calibrated and you have to understand how to go about it, right? Like I've literally hired hundreds of virtual assistants by now, right? So when you can call on that breadth of experience, whereas if you're just doing it like as a one-off exercise, yeah, you're not going to be great at it. And that's kind of to be expected, right? So if you can draw on somebody that has the repetition, has the experience, both inside of their own operating company, but also for other people, then you're probably just going to get a better deliverable in the end is what it comes down to. For sure. Okay. So now let's say hypothetically you you find someone who is a good fit, you know, a virtual assistant that is a good fit based on the hiring process. What are some of the roles that you would, you know, just delegate overseas as opposed to just keep in house here in the States or in, in Canada in your case? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's North America. It's all the same as far as I'm concerned. So for me, like I, I had a like no holds approach to it really. Like basically that customer life cycle was all operated by the virtual assistant. So from the moment the customer calls in or they submit a form or they send us an email asking for a job or a quote, right? VA can do that. Next step, let's go over to our CRM. If we don't have a profile set up for that customer, let's create one. If we have one, let's find it. VA can do that, right? Even down to like the draft quote. And even in our case, we had our virtual assistants doing remote Google Street View quoting. And we did have like just a little bit of what I call a checkpoint in mind. So in our Slack channel, we had just a separate channel that was for quoting. And basically they, in that channel, they could paste a screen capture of what they were coding on. And then their guesstimate as to what they would be charging the customer for those services. And we would just, from the office, just give them a thumbs up or say, no, not $329, let's go $499 or whatever it is. And from there, they could kind of pick up where they left off and then, you know, send that quote out to the customer, uh, present it using value-centric verbiage that that asked for the close in the end and then ultimately yeah getting them a time reserved in the schedule like they could do it pretty much all so outside of things that like physically require that person to be present uh we we really leveraged vas to do the vast majority of of the admin gotcha okay so essentially any role that doesn't require you to literally go out to someone's house, you're working with a virtual assistant to manage that role. Yeah. And like back when it was really difficult to hire people through like the COVID era, when, you know, people were getting paid to stay at home and all the rest of it, we actually had one VA allocated to our hiring funnel for our technicians. Because again, we would go from two to 32. Well, that's a lot of resumes to go through. That's a lot of initial interviews. That's a lot of a lot, right? So we actually had our VAs helping with our technician hiring funnel as well. So yeah, they can do a lot of stuff. I actually created a free ebook, which I'm happy to share with the audience. It, it's at ninjava.com slash guide. And basically it answers the question like, what can a VA do in a home service business? And you might be surprised with what you come across in that document. And it really gets the creative juices flowing as far as like how far you can go with it. And I think the other reality is you can absolutely scale in this dimension. It's not to say that, you know, you get your one VA and then you got to start to revert back to in-person managers or, or, you know, admin, you, you can continue to scale as I did. And in our case, we actually had one of our four VAs was the manager of the VAs. Her name was Jan and the three other VAs kind of answered to her as the first point of contact. So it's really cool to see that like, yes, it's affordable. Yes, it's high quality and it scales as you continue to grow your business. For sure. Okay. So let's say I'm running a business and I'm starting to get super busy, uh, which is a good thing. We're starting to get enough work where I need to outsource some of my work. What would you suggest is delegated to a virtual assistant first? Yeah. So I would do a little bit of an audit on your time, right? Like what is, what is soaking up your time? Because ultimately speaking, like if we can save you for, if you're in the like the earlier stages of business, if you can reserve your time almost exclusively as best you can for going out and selling jobs and then hiring and training other technicians, like that's the greatest gift and contribution that you can make to your company, right? So all those other things, if they're starting to stack up and the problem is, is like 
those low level repetitive tasks, you know, the, the ringing phone that needs to be answered, the trivial email that needs a response, like, unfortunately, those things generally have to be done before we have the luxury of going into the higher value activities. So I would say if, if you're spending a lot of time and it's preventing you from getting to those higher value activities, it's probably time to start thinking seriously or your business is gonna start to kind of hinder in terms of its growth trajectory. The other thing I always like to bring up is as an entrepreneur, you gotta guard your psyche, right? So if those low level tasks that are ongoing, repetitive, mundane, if they're taking your energy versus bringing you energy, then I think you gotta be very aware of that fact, right? Because if you're doing tasks that leach your energy all day long, you're gonna have nothing left in the tank to go like build an awesome company, right? So from both a, a time perspective as well as an energy perspective, you really wanna keep an eye on it. And then when you're able, make that jump and, and get somebody else to help you. Okay, so you're saying whatever, audit your time, find out what is taking up the most time out of your day. Some things you might not be able to outsource right away, but if you really take a look at your day to day, you're gonna to find tons of stuff that you can probably delegate out to someone else. Um, and so once it makes sense to make the transition, find a virtual assistant, train them on those things you're doing and just free up your time by delegating that to them. Yeah, yeah. I would also say too, like take the opportunity to kind of work out what does the like perfect performance look like inside your company, right? Like after you're done a job, do you reach out to the customer to thank them and to ask for a review and to make sure they're totally satisfied, right? You might want to do that, but if you're busy, you might not actually get the luxury of doing those sorts of things. You know it's valuable, you know it makes sense and it's good business practice, but you're only one person, right? So if you don't have the bandwidth, sometimes sometimes you start to sacrifice or shortcut on these other things that are very important to do, but you just don't consider or you don't follow through with them. Let's say you outlining the exact role that you're looking for. You have your SOPs in place, which you're talking about is making sure you have the systems in place before you just throw someone into that role. How do you go about the onboarding process? Because I've heard a lot of people talk about bringing on virtual assistants and then they kind of just expect them to know the role when obviously that's not gonna be the case. How do you go about training to make sure they're properly trained? Yeah, so um, for our users, we have like some pretty elaborate built out guides. And one that I just completed is actually how to onboard a ninja. And the the sentiment or the, the kind of Cole's notes of that, I would say uh, a, f a few little nuggets here. So. First off, I would say, take the time to visualize what you're gonna have to get them to do. And if there's any sort of like access or user accounts or any of that, uh, password managers, like let's get all that figured out in advance, right? Cause if they just show up and then you're like, oh crap, like you need access to my CRM and, and to my email account and I have none of this prepared. Like that's gonna be clunky. It's also gonna kind of lack professionalism a little bit. Um, so I would say do that inventory, see what tasks we need them to have computer access to. Um, the other thing is I like the concept of what's called a soft start. So instead of saying, okay, hey, Susie VA, you start next Monday at 8 a.m. I like to say, hey, let's have a, like a one or two hour discussion leading up to next Monday when you're gonna start. And let's go over our core values. Let me show you our software. Let me show you our CRM. And that gives you an opportunity to like kind of get the juices flowing. No doubt coming out of that experience, you're gonna have other stuff to be like, oh, okay, she can do this, she can do that. And I gotta get this prepared, right? But also from her perspective, it's probably gonna make her feel a little bit more at ease. And it's not like we're, we're building up anticipation for that big day of kicking off a 40 hour week of training all at once. So I really like the soft start idea as well. Um, in addition to that, I would say, you know, the day before start day, reach out to them. See if they're, they're there, see if they have access, see if they're on schedule, make sure they know where they're going so that, again, they feel supported and ultimately that they can be their best version of themselves. Once they show up, I would say for that first week of onboarding, you really in advance got to go into your own schedule and account for that commitment that you're making, right? Because if you're just like, hey, you got this, this is here, and th this is that, and okay, you're good, okay, bye. Well, you can't expect the world to change around a relationship that starts that way, right? So what I'd say at a very minimum is for that first week, plan on doing a sign-in call and a sign-out call, like a video call, like what we're doing right here, right? So 
that allows for you to make them feel like they're supported, to create that sense of connection, and ultimately to like check in and make sure that they're they're progressing the way you would have hoped. And then after that, I think you can slowly start to dissipate away from that. But I would say that first week is is very crucial to to be hands on and and to be present. One hundred percent. I mean, that's the case with any role really but especially when you're hiring people overseas where it's completely virtual it's very easy to just lose track of time and go about your day and kind of neglect them so one are they feeling neglected and not like they're being seen or heard within the company but also you have no idea what they're doing you don't have no idea if they're progressing if they're doing things the right way Um, and especially if they're representing your company by speaking with customers that could be a big issue so what you're saying is be proactive check your schedule make sure you put set aside the necessary time to speak with them beginning of day end of day review everything they're doing Um, and obviously eventually that's going to like you said dissipate and you won't need to put as much time towards it but if you're going to do this do it right by putting the necessary time towards them in the beginning so i definitely want to dive into like the incentive pay especially I'm, i'm curious about the virtual assistant side of things as well but is there anything else you feel like would be important to talk about when it comes to virtual assistants before we move on from that i mean they're awesome they're they're one of two massive breakthroughs that I experienced in a decade and a half of being in the trenches, running my home service business. And I think it's always just feels like you're pushing a rock up a hill. And as you get bigger, it feels like the target on your back gets bigger too. And virtual assistance and then as well, performance pay were the two areas where we just felt like everything got a lot easier once we figured those two components out. So whether you use Ninja VA or a different agency or you try and hire one on your own, like VAs are awesome, and I'm always happy to talk shop. Like I said, ninjava.com slash guide is a great resource to check out to just get the creative juices flowing as far as what can they do in, in your business specifically to, to lighten the load and, and make you grow faster and make more money. For sure. I think there's some roles where, um, you know, some people have the American dream of having that office, having an office manager, things like that. Um, but, you know, with modern times, things are changing. The smarter business move is usually working with someone overseas. But regardless, even if it's not for every role within your company, there's at least some roles which absolutely should be delegated um, you know, overseas where you can get uh, cheaper labor and probably higher quality service as well. So virtual assistance is huge for these type of businesses. With that being said, are you doing any type of incentive? I know you're doing this for your technicians and we're gonna dive into that. Are you doing any type of incentive pay when it comes to virtual assistance? So incentivizing and and applying performance pay to indirect office help is is really quite a tricky thing because you got to be very careful about what you incentivize right for instance if you're like hey we want to get through 100 emails in a day well you can expect very likely that the the caliber and the quality of those emails is just going to go down right Mm -hmm. so you got to be very careful how you wield and how you deploy performance pay and what i've found generally speaking when it comes to office labor be it in person or admin remote, um, you, you, you don't really want to incentivize quantity. I'd say if we're winning as a company, let's celebrate together. And if we hit, you know, that $500,000 mark for the year, great. Like, let's all celebrate. Let's have something exciting that they benefit with. But in terms of specific deliverables or events or tasks, it, it's a really tricky one in itself. Gotcha. Okay. But when it comes to technicians, something a lot of people aren't doing is that performance pay structure. And that is something you are all about is incentivizing your technicians. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? 100% I can. Yeah. So like at the end of the day, at 30,000 feet, what a service business does is you sell the proceeds of your technician's time, right? So if we have a technician that shows up, gets a large amount of work done in a short period of time, that's more valuable to us right? Like that's the end all reality. And when that is the case, we can afford to recognize and reward that technician who's doing a great job because of the high value that they're bringing to the table. Okay. And so in what ways are you able to like reward them? Can you kind of talk about that structure a little bit? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few different ways you can do it. At the end of the day though, I think when it comes to reward, I think cash speaks right at the end of the day, if you're dealing with 19 to 23 year olds, like I was, you know, having more money on the paycheck just speaks volumes. And you can, like I said, you can go off that beaten path. You can have points or you can have some sort of giveaways or rewards or whatever. But I feel like the universal language here is cash. You also got to remember too, though, performance play 
performance pay deployed properly should incorporate some level of recognition as well, right? This is that like friendly uh, competition or that like, uh, you know, healthy camaraderie where they're all huddled around to look at basically who won the day yesterday and they get the bragging rights for the day. Certain personality types are actually gonna respond more to that as the motive than an extra 50 or 100 or $200 on their paycheck. So performance pay done properly would probably encompass both of those as, as ways to kind of give motivation out to your technicians. No, yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, you know, doing little things definitely helps like buying them, you know, a treat from a, you know, Starbucks or something or getting them a gift card, things like that are nice, but at the end of the day, cash above everything else. Most people, if they see some extra money on their paycheck, they're gonna be super happy. So um, I know one thing you said is just efficiency and getting them to be efficient with their time and get through more work because that means one technician can be worth a lot more, a lot more for your business. How do you kind of track that? And then I guess what is like the structure around, you know, the efficiency and like the bonus structure based off of that? Yeah. So there's a number of different formulas you can use or systems you can use. But at the end of the day, we call it productivity right? So productivity is measured in dollars per hour of revenue per technician, right? So they go out into the field, they clean a bunch of windows, or they do a bunch of pressure washing, they might bring in, you know, $200 an hour. That $200 an hour is kind of the building block. That's like the lifeblood of performance pay. And granted, there's kind of two different sides of performance pay. We have productivity on one side, which is what we're talking about now. We also have the other side, which we call performance bonuses. And those are like one-off events, like reviews, referrals, upsells, or they could be negative things like callbacks, coming in late. Through the combination of both those things, that's kind of the overall, what, what is encompassed by performance pay, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Relating back to your question there, as far as the productivity side goes, so one of the main ways that people do it is inside of Bonus Up, we have what is called hourly plus bonus meaning your technicians still get their base wage and it could be a very aggressive local offering, right? So it's easy to crew up and, and get these top notch caliber individuals on your team. So you might pay them 20 or $25 as a base wage. But then on top of that, we'd have a tiered system. So say, for example, if you guys produce at $100 an hour, you get an extra $3 an hour bonus. And if you're at $150 an hour, you get an extra $6 an hour bonus. So you get your base wage all the way through, regardless of what happens, but then we get to sweeten the situation a little bit if you are hitting those bonus tiers. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's a really good strategy, um, basically outlining what your goal is in terms of revenue generated per hour, having a tier system. So if they're below the number you're trying to shoot for, um, either there's no additional pay or just a smaller amount. If they're within that KPI, then they get that additional bonus. Have you ever noticed any issues in... And this might be me overthinking it and just the fact that I speak with so many business owners that they started their business because of exactly this, but hearing like, you know, I'm producing this company $200 per hour, why not just start my own business? Have you ever noticed that by being so transparent around the revenue they're generating per hour? Definitely. Yeah, there's kind of two schools of thought. There's there's the like, let's be fully transparent or let's let's really keep that stuff to ourselves so that to your point, you know, we're not faced with a mutiny or a bunch of people breaking off and using our customer list to go start their own little side hustle. And for me, I mean, no, no one of those options is correct. At the end of the day, though, the way I see it be done the, the worst is if you just tell them in the first scenario, hey, guys, you're bringing in $200 an hour. And you don't tell them, but our payroll is $20,000 every two weeks. And here's my MasterCard that's showing like a maxed out status. And, you know, we have expenses as well as we make revenue. You don't want to just show them one side of the equation. You can also do it another way too. Like inside of bonus up, you can basically codify. So although it's still dealing with dollars per hour, it converts it basically into like a very easy to metabolize point schedule. So instead of saying like a hundred dollars per hour, it would be a 7.0, right? And that's just what they become fluent with. And basically you move the decimal and you subtract 30. That's all you're doing. But you're not telling Bobby that he just made the company 100 or $200 an hour because without the full understanding of that, it could be motivating in a different direction that we're not 
super keen on. 100%. And yeah, that's actually, I really like that strategy. It's a little less transparent, but you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to be telling your, you know, your team members every single thing about your business. Now, I've definitely seen businesses where they are fully transparent in that, and they're literally sharing their P&Ls and their expenses with their employees just so there's full transparency. But, you know, in most cases, like, that's just not necessary and uh, really beyond, like, their, their scope of work. So I definitely like that strategy you just outlined. Now, when it comes to callbacks, to negative things where it's detracting from the work, how do you kind of incentivize them to avoid those situations? Yeah, definitely. So um, the beauty of performance pay is it creates a sense of alignment with your technicians. So they ultimately will care about the same things that you care about if it's deployed properly, right? So that is with respect to the first side of things with the production and the productivity, you know, we called it healthy urgency. They're gonna come ready to go and they're gonna be on their toes and they're gonna be always thinking about the next thing so that we can hustle the job along. That's great for the owner and that's great for the technician, right? With performance pay. And now we have that sense of alignment. The same holds true when it comes to callbacks, right? As owners, we don't want stuff being left behind uh, parts of the job being forgotten, uh, gates being left open, like whatever the case might be, we don't want to have to go back. Cause when we have to go back, it's embarrassing and it's expensive ultimately speaking. So the way we handle callbacks is first and foremost, we have to differentiate. We got to talk in terms of whether it's a valid callback or if it's an invalid callback. If it's a valid callback, this is something that they ought to have avoided, right? Like this falls inside of their job duties and like, you forgot the sidewalk on the side of the home. And like, that's the reality. We were there to clean the sidewalks and you forgot one of them. So that would be a valid callback, right? An invalid callback might be something along the lines of like, hey, the customer called in to complain, but like they never turned on the water. So like we couldn't have accessed that back portion or whatever the case might have been, right? In that case, I'm not gonna really treat it in the same way with my technicians because they couldn't do anything inside of their control to affect the, the outcome, right? So if it is a valid callback, we want to give them that ongoing and regular feedback. And we want to give them the ability to see what they did wrong so that they can progress through it. In terms of how you operate your company, though, you, your culture is really going to be impacted by how you conduct the performance pay. So I've seen some companies where they're like, hey, Bobby, you got a valid callback. You, you forgot that section along the back again, man. Not a big deal. It's all good. High five. Let's go out there and have a great day. Or I've seen other companies where it's like, Bobby, you got a valid callback, hundred bucks coming off your bonus. It's done. Right? So depending on how you want to do it, I think at the end of the day, there needs to be a bit of a carrot and there needs to be a bit of a stick, right? There needs to be rewards and there also needs to be penalties. How hard you go into either direction is, is purely up to the culture that you want to leave behind. Yeah. That's a really good point. It completely depends on your type of culture, the type of business you're looking to run. What I've seen in the past and what I've kind of liked, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this, is for whatever time it takes them during that callback, they don't make their hourly base pay for that time since at the end of the day, it is a callback. What are your thoughts on that type of approach? I'd be cautious with that. Um, cautious in that like the way we structure things and the way we publish things, we don't want to open ourselves up to future liability. And, you know, we anything that we implement in our in our company culture or the, the methods and process that we we follow could potentially come back. And if we're putting in the handbook, hey, we're not paying you for work that we're telling you to go do. You got to be careful, right? Because that in the wrong hands or, you know, dad's a lawyer or attorney or whatever. You just don't want to create a system where you have this ongoing liability. So. I would always recommend stick to your local state guidelines and your rules with respect to labor. Um, but ultimately we want to create that sense of, did you understand what happened? Can we articulate like a better way of doing it going forward? And is this a pattern that's forming or is this just like a one-off basis? The answer to those questions is really going to dictate for me as the, the mentor, the leader, how we're going to, follow through with that technician and and how deep and how severe it's going to be absolutely that's really great feedback and so it makes sense how to avoid uh, low quality work or you know avoid getting callbacks or any negative feedback like that 
Now, when it comes to positive uh, engagements, like a Google review or uh, anything like that, how do you push for them to go out of their way? Because I've seen a lot of technicians in the past where they just show up, do the job, and they're out. They don't care to speak with the customer or give them an amazing experience. How do you incentivize them to actually do that? So the slightly longer answer is you have to cast the vision and you have to share what's important at your organization, right? For us, we had four priorities and they had to be considered in this order. Number one was safety. No matter what we go out there and do today, if we're going to get hurt or seriously injured, like, let's just not even bother. Like, so if that's not the first priority, it sounds cliche, but if it's not the first priority, then what are we even doing here, right? The second one needs to be customer service because it's more about how we make our customers feel than even what we even do for them at their property. The third is quality. We have to give them a professional grade because they just hired professionals and it needs to be what they can achieve on their own from Home Depot or Lowe's on a weekend, right? And then the fourth and only then is the fourth productivity. Smooth is fast and when those three first priorities are taken care of, then we can go at a brisk pace, we can instill a little healthy urgency and we can we can move at a faster rate. But if we go just fast first, to your point, then we're going to look like a chicken with their head cut off and we're going to miss on three other very important variables. 100%. That'll probably lead to a lot of callbacks as well. So I was curious how you incentivize efficiency without lack of quality. But the way you outline makes a lot of sense. So that's, that's awesome. And then I'm curious, do you have like a set structure like uh, with reviews, I'm sure it's probably an additional 10 $20, whatever amount you guys dictate. Is there any other little things you do just to add more to that base pay they can expect? No. As far as I'm concerned, we got to keep it really simple here. I see so many people get so creative on the whiteboard, the drawing board, whatever, and it gets to the point where your technicians don't even know what's going on or more importantly, they don't know how to, how to really do well by whatever the bonus structure is, right? So my... Overall litmus test is, can your technicians describe how they get paid to their spouse at the dinner table, right? Like full stop, if they can't do that, you gotta go rework what you've contrived because you're not gonna get engagement and you're not gonna get buy-in because it's just too crazy. If we care about reviews, perfect, pay them for a review. 10 bucks for a review or 20 bucks for a review, doesn't matter what kind, right? Forgo the, the little minutia details in terms of where it came from or what happened or whatever. It's, did they get a review? Yes, 20 bucks, great. Everyone on board, whatever. Uh, if we get a referral, what, what's the handling of a referral, right? What's the handling of an upsell? Those things are all good, so let's make it really easy for them to, to accelerate on those dimensions. 100%, yeah, simplicity scale, so that makes a lot of sense. And I was actually gonna ask you, what about like upsells? Would you like allow your technicians to make additional income from upsells or? Yeah, definitely, it's, it's healthy for your organization to be doing upsells. And ultimately it's it's a good thing for your customer. It's almost like it's your duty to provide as much as your, of your service as you possibly can to your local community. And you're providing this this sense of fulfillment and they get to appreciate their, their yards and their properties more. And like, it is your duty to provide your service. So if we achieve that by virtue of an upsell, then then that's great. We still attain the overall mission here. 100%. Awesome. And I know we, we're very strapped for time. Now, I'm just curious if you can just give me like a very quick understanding. How do you have your technicians go about the upsells? Like, are they basically noticing, oh, wow, like this is pretty bad. This should be done. And then they bring it up with the homeowner. Do they have a set pitch or can you kind of share that with me? This is the Josh Latimer. I notice blank. I rep recommend blank, right? Hey, Mrs. Smith, I noticed you have algae growing on the outside of your gutters. I would recommend you have that cleaned off because it's going to affect the value of your home. It's going to get worse over time. It's, you know, pick whatever you want. Um, did you want to get that done today? And it's like a hard close, right? Did you want us to just get that done for you? And this is speaking to that convenience element, which ultimately speaking, that's a huge reason why we're even at that property to begin with, right? So let's do more of that. Let's give more of this feeling of accomplishment, enhance the property and offer and, and do so with the feeling of convenience intact. For sure. And so are your technicians trained on pricing out those upsells or are they relaying it back to your virtual assistants who are getting back to them in real time? Can you kind of share that? Yeah, I want to make it as easy as it, as possible for my technicians to perform on that dimension. So if they're 
some some technicians, if they're younger, they, they might be kind of adverse to the selling process, right? Like they might be a little standoffish, right? So we want to alleviate that as best as we can. So if we always said, like, if you're not comfortable doing that pitch, then relay the information to the office. We'll call them even while you're still on the property and we'll still give you credit for the upsell, right? So again, I think it's about creating a situation where ultimately speaking, we achieve the result we're looking for. We help the customer with another thing on their to-do list and whether or not it's the tech that does that or you know somebody in the office that calls them that, that feels good about doing it, doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I imagine there's some technicians within people's businesses that just do not want to speak with customers um, or at least don't want to try to sell them on additional services. But that strategy you outlined just makes a lot of sense and definitely alleviates that stress on them. Um, otherwise, I'm sure there's been scenarios where people just wouldn't offer it because they don't want that confrontation with the with the customer. So that's a great approach with it. Yeah. And the other thing too, to point out, sometimes you're going to have technicians that don't want to do upsells because they already got a full day of work orders, right? So you have to create a situation where they don't feel like they're penalizing themselves and having to work till 7 p.m. by virtue of following through with what the boss wanted or what the company cares about and doing more upselling, right? So you have to have that ability to either rebook that work or have another crew assist them on the, the latter part of their day or whatever support you need so that they don't feel like they're being adversely affected by virtue of getting a call back, if that makes sense. Or sorry, an upsell rather, an upsell. Cool. Well, um, with that being said, this was super valuable and super helpful for anyone that is in that stage where, you know, they're starting to scale up. They want to bring on team members, want to see where to find them, who to outsource, you know, how to incentivize, uh, you know, quality performance. So with all of that being said, this was really valuable. For people that want to learn a bit more about you and kind of what you do, where could they find you? Yeah, I would say uh, ninjava.com. You can book a demo or bonusup.com. And uh, I love to talk about this stuff. This I feel like these are our breakthrough topics after doing this stuff for a decade and a half. So the sooner you can do it, uh, the better. And I'm always happy to talk shop. Awesome. Well, once again, I really appreciate you for hopping on. This was super valuable. And I hope everyone watching this video enjoyed it. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Michael.